Okay, um, yeah, we can start the session. So good evening, everyone. And while we wait for other people to join in, uh, there are some housekeeping rules that I would want to flag for the audience, especially. Uh, so all the participants are requested to keep their audios and videos off throughout the course of the event. And only the panelists are required to keep their uh, audios and videos on. Uh, the other thing is that all the questions for the part uh, that the participants have for the panelists need to be addressed to the window titled um, questions and answers and we have a separate Q&A session parked for the end uh, at the end of the session so we can take the questions from there uh, the other important thing is that the event will be is is live streaming on India Migration Now's uh, Facebook page. So this is another reason why I request uh, everyone again to switch off their mics. Right. Uh, on that note, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for joining us for the webinar today on mainstreaming migration, where we will specifically be looking at the role of intermediaries in enabling last mile access uh, to social welfare for migrants. Um, so we have a fantastic panel of speakers here, ranging from researchers to practitioners to employers and all in one room to discuss a topic which is otherwise uh, been communicated in silos. Uh, a primer on the, on the fellowship. So this, this webinar is a part of the IMN Bandhu Fellowship and is the third in the series of four webinars. Um, the previous webinars were um, on de-risking migration and financing migration. So in case anyone is interested, they can visit uh, the IMN Facebook page and refer to them. Uh, my introduction, I'm Chitra, I'm the Research and Operations Manager at India Migration Now and Chalo Network. At IMN, we center all our work uh, around migrant households, uh, that is uh, migrants in India, to India, and uh, within India. Uh, Chalo Network is the implementation arm of IMN, and we apply all our learnings on internal migration in order to strengthen uh, financial inclusion of migrant households along all major migrant corridors in India. Uh, so the pandemic uh, really uh, visibilized the invisible workforce, so to say, uh, and especially uh, migrant workers. And the fellowship, therefore, is a culmination. Uh, and, and the thought behind the fellowship was to mainstream migration within the development discourse and to bring migration within uh, the purview of, of development. So I am in collaborated with Bandhu Urban Tech, which is a tech-based platform that uses its grassroots expertise and big data in order to uh, facilitate housing, employment, and uh, social security benefits. Um, last but not least, I would extend my thanks to our fellows, Harshita and Varsha, especially for curating and conceptualizing uh, this entire webinar series. Right. Uh, so uh, like I discussed earlier, while the pandemic brought uh, the issues of uh, the migrant workers to the forefront and really helped in, uh, not helped, but really mainstreamed uh, migration, so to say, it was also amply clear that there are, uh, that, the, that the social welfare system is mired with its own uh, problems and its own challenges uh, with respect to access, design, implementation, uh, and facilitation. And intermediaries really play an important role in facilitating that access uh, or in, in the last mile delivery of uh, social welfare to migrant workers. And we saw it uh, during the lockdowns after the lockdowns that different players in, in within the system, say for example, NGOs, CSOs, um, banking correspondents, they all played and assumed different roles in delivering uh, this access so that migrant workers uh, particularly do not get uh, left behind. Uh, while we talk about intermediaries and how different players assumed the role of intermediaries, uh, this webinar here is precisely to unpack that term. What do we really understand by an intermediary? Uh, what are the roles that they play in social welfare? Uh, is the social welfare system designed to meet the needs of migrant workers at all? And how, how and where does technological innovation exactly feature in this uh, last mile delivery of welfare? 
services. At the same time, we are also going to discuss the integration of intermediaries and access and claim and uh, the, the, the different challenges that the social infrastructure uh, itself uh, is designed into. And from there on, we are going to discuss the scope of innovation and, and just let's just see what, you know, really the conversations that really come out from here. Uh, so, right. On that note, we have Dr. Kale, Dr. Sumita Kale with us, who is an economist and has worked extensively on uh, financial inclusion, including uh, the intermediaries. Uh, she's an advisor for Indicus Foundation and has been leading the Center for Financial Inclusion since 2011. Uh, so Dr. Kale, from your work, uh, what, what exactly is the role of an intermediary in bridging these last mile uh, access or last mile delivery of financial and welfare benefits uh, in India? Over to you, Dr. Kale. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity of uh, being the key speaker at this, at this webinar series and to share our work from Indicus. Uh, just to give a short background, um, at Indicus, we've been looking at financial inclusion and digital payments, the policy space, since 2006. And we began our Indicus Center for Financial Inclusion in 2011. Um, there is a very strong connection between um, financial inclusion and the welfare payouts that are given by the government. And this connect, actually, uh, the DBT, the direct benefit transfers, are used as a hook to bring the financially excluded into the banking system, right? Because the the banks and the, these unserved segments have literally no interest and no relation with each other at all. So the government welfare, all the support schemes which are given to the weaker sections who typically have irregular, low income, uh, lack of documentation and so on, they, any support scheme that is given from the government through the bank starts becoming one connection which brings these people who are outside the system into the system. Right? So it is a hook. And after this, they're expected to be delivering other support, other uh, schemes, like whether it's pension, whether it's insurance, or whether there are other welfare schemes which are um, in play. So uh, we have been looking at the banking network because you know if you look at the direct benefit transfers, the way it has evolved over the years, there are so many schemes. There are so many different kinds of um, um, you know, uh, programs, which governments at different levels. There's the center, there's state government, the local governments, everybody has their own special schemes which they roll out for different segments and different uh, kinds of um, uh, parts of the population. Now earlier, we all know how much of leakage uh, there was through, uh, through, the, through the welfare, through the support schemes. And uh, it was very, um, how shall I say, amorphous and heterogeneous all across the country. So the direct benefit transfers, which actually came into existence probably sometime in like 2011, 2012, 2012 was actually being um, um, visualized and conceptualized at that point. It got a um, key start during 2014 with the Jandhan accounts, because that's when you had the surge and the push and the mission mode that was um, across the country to get people beneficiaries, uh, to get the beneficiaries um, onto the banking system and to get them accounts. So the Jam Trinity, which was there, the Jandhan, Aadhaar, and the mobile, you know, this connection, this framework, and then the DBT mission, which was put in the cabinet secretariat, and then was the architecture was completely revamped. And it's, I think we've seen a huge revolution since about 2017, where a lot of, um, there's been a phenomenal coverage, right? The problem is, Despite all the achievements, despite all the success that the DPT mission has had in covering and you know bringing uh, access to welfare scheme uh, to to the beneficiaries at the last mile, um, India being the country it is, the more you cover the standard segments, right? Like scholarships, um, um, you know, you can say the maternity benefits, these kind of plans. The more you cover these, which are the standard ones already in play, the ones which were not covered before or which were excluded again start coming up um, in the front in the fore and this is the case especially for the migrant workers because they were invisible right like you said before uh, before the lockdown they were really invisible and they were completely off the radar and now suddenly all governments whether it's central state and the local are suddenly galvanized into doing something for this segment which they didn't really let's be honest care about them at all much right i mean there was something in play uh, in in the system but it really wasn't enforced legislation laws nothing was really enforced so this really needed to get on board 
So um, all kinds of schemes have come on now. The Ishram portal, for instance, even to try registration for them and the One Nation, One Ration Card scheme, which I'm sure people are going to be talking about. Intermediaries, there are a whole list of them. There's a huge chain. You know, when you start from the main government, whichever government it is, uh, whichever department it is, who's actually identifying, who's registering, how does uh, how do they connect the state government, the departments, again, you come down to the district level, to the village level, and so on. So the intermediaries are a very long list of them. Stakeholders are huge. Uh, we at Indicus look at the banking part. We look at the business correspondent network. So I would, most of my work uh, deals with that. So I'll be talking about those, and I'm sure other people will be talking about the other uh, in the chain, in the uh, chain of delivery. Um, so like I said, for all its success, there are a huge bunch of issues in DBT uh, that still remain to be addressed. And we can put them under two uh, you know, main buckets. One of them is identifying the beneficiaries for a particular scheme and enrolling them, right? In migrant workers, especially, I think this is a huge problem. And I'm, I think later speakers are going to be talking about the problem of definition, identifying who exactly is a migrant worker and so on, and then getting them onto a particular scheme, which is meant for them. The second part of it is the operational issues, which are faced by beneficiaries after the enrollment. And that's typically the kind of space in which we've been working on. Um, for instance, Aadhaar, okay, huge backbone, amazing architecture in place, but another, lots of issues with actual, at the actual implementation uh, scale, uh, at, at the implementation at the last mile. Uh, they're very simple things like, you know, fingerprint mismatch. Uh, or fingerprint authentication at which service delivery might fail. Now, the problem out here is we found out that there are SOPs already put in place by the DPT mission as well as the UIDAI. But the banking agent or the business correspondent at the last mile or even maybe at the PDS shop is not aware of all that needs to be done for the best finger detection, right? So even though they, feel, they say that 98% or 99% of the beneficiaries are getting their, um, their due, uh, there are still 1%, even if there's 0.5% of the beneficiaries enrolled. So that, you know, there's an exclusion risk at, in identification, there's an exclusion risk at enrollment, and then you come to the operational part where people are actually being excluded even after being enrolled. Then you have a whole uh, range of issues dealing with the bank account. The person may be having a bank account, but there may be a problem in accessing it. It can be frozen. Now, during the lockdown, this happened to a lot of people who had uh, KYC was not updated in time according to the bank's protocol. They shut it down and the RBI had to put in an urgent circular saying that no KYC updation should would be done, right? So what I'm trying to give a sense of is the, the range of problems that can occur at every step because there are so many different people involved, right? Even though you see the business correspondent at the last mile and he's the point of contact for the beneficiary, there is a lot of the back end that needs to be actually sorted out uh, for the um, welfare payout, right? And then you have um, inadequate service quality. Um, this is something we've worked extensively on. We're looking at a, you know, a very well-trained, viable agent network in rural India. Okay, it is a bedrock, absolutely, for a smooth, smooth flow of, uh, you know, support or uh, uh, whatever the government has put out as a scheme to actually reach the person, uh, the beneficiary out there. I'll probably go into this in a greater detail if you want later on. But uh, like I said, there's a training issue, there's a viability issue, there are lots of issues at that actually at the last point. Uh, we had uh, put out four, um, uh, you know. Um, key takeaways that we had of what will actually make the system really work better. And we, what we felt is that you need a very strong grievance redressal platform. Right now, there isn't anything at all. Nobody knows what to do, whom to, whom to go to, what to say, uh, what to say to whom. And uh, we need a much better monitoring and oversight mechanism, much better coordination and interaction amongst the multiple stakeholders. If you look at the Ishram portal, for instance, you, there's, a, there's one page that tells you about the stakeholders and the list of them, right? You have the um, uh, Central Ministry you, uh, of Labor and Employment, whose baby this is. Then you have the Ministry of Electronics and uh, Information Technology, the MITE, which is supposed to be the secretariat for putting everything together. Then you have the EPFO, you have the State Insurance Corporation, you have the state governments for identification and registration, you have the line ministries for all the separate schemes that you have, you'll have the NPCI, you'll have the UIDA, you'll have a whole uh, lot of people in the chain. 
And then finally, you come to what the beneficiary actually gets when he uh, comes to get his uh, his money at the at the counter, so to say, right? So intermediaries there are many, and then you also also have these social um, audits that really need to take place, as far as audit uh, monitoring and oversight, because there is no data um, there's no data framework here for ensuring that people are actually getting what uh, they've en been enrolled for. I hope this helps. Yeah, no, that's very extensive, uh, Dr. Kale. Yeah, and and it's it's, I mean, it's interesting how you weave those points of what happens at you know different kinds of intermediaries, and then how exactly the things translate to on ground. And uh, I mean, on that note, we have uh, Madhura from Hagdarshak here, and uh, Hagdarshak has been working on grassroots and delivering uh, social entitlements uh, to to different. To, to a host uh, range of uh, of workers, which also includes migrant workers, and uh, it includes uh, you know eligible government schemes, eligible private welfare schemes. Um, Madhura is currently the chief growth officer at Hagdarshak, uh, so I would actually ask Madhura on you know what are it, to, to to really go in detail and from your field operations, what are the issues that you note on ground, um, and how are you able to approach and address these? Thanks, Chitra, and thanks everyone uh, for having me here. Um, I think I'm I'm actually going to sort of uh, repeat a lot of what uh, you know Sumita just said because that's that's what we go through every single day on the field. Um, again, to quickly uh, talk about Hagdarshak in the last six years, what we've done is we've made a repository of schemes uh, and mapped the eligibility on our um, you know, mobile platform, uh, so that the first challenge of even identifying a beneficiary and telling the beneficiary uh, about their eligibility to a multi multiple schemes at different levels, state, central, or even district and municipal uh, is solved. Um, and that is actually facilitated through a network of agents in the field because assisted tech is something that we believe uh, is extremely crucial with the kind of TG that we are working on. Everything tech is uh, unfortunately not the way to go today. And we first started working actually, um, you know, six years ago with construction workers. One of the biggest problems that we found was because they came from a particular region in the country to another, another city, uh, even if they were exposed to basic financial inclusion services like a bank account or a ration card, everything was back home. Um, so what happens is when they are here and when they get, most of them are get, get paid through cash, but when it comes to actually using finances to towards welfare in, in, in their workplace, uh, they really don't know what to do and where to go. Um, a second uh, sort of problem is, you know, very basic things like uh, a real example was, you know, when DBTs were announced during the pandemic um, and they were literally directly transferred to people who were uh, registered under the BOCW board. So the so the catchphrase there was if you were a part of the BOCW board, then you would get the DBT. Uh, it wasn't that everybody who's a construction worker and identifies himself or herself as a construction worker just got that automatically into their account, which was the notion that you know many people in the ecosystem thought so. Uh, that was number one. So there was a lot of sort of awareness and sensitization that was needed to these people to tell them that you know. Yeah, while there is a thousand rupees credit in an account for a construction worker, if you don't have the membership or if you've not paid that 80 rupee, you know, revision sort of a resubscription fee, you're not going to get it. The second layer was, you know, people who had this um, sort of subscription to the board, but whose Aadhaar was not seeded to their bank account. Now, there's a massive difference between linking and seeding, we all know. But who's going to tell that to that construction worker? When you ask them, hey, is your Aadhaar seeded to your uh, bank account? They, they'll say, ki, ha, link kiya tha. Uh, but link kiya tha is, does not mean money is going to come in because you're not connected to the NPCI infrastructure or because it's not seeded. Uh, so in fact, a lot of our work initially when the lockdowns hit uh, was actually just helping people do their KYC and sort that out. Uh, you know, because if there are recurring tranches of money that come from the government, we don't want them to miss out because of these small things. And that's just just unawareness. Right. Um, and then there were people saying that, hey, I'm, I'm stuck on at this construction site or I'm stuck in the city. Where do I go to get this seeding done? 
uh, I do not have access to digital banking. Uh, you and I can actually just log on to our uh, net banking and do that. Uh, so then that is where the assisted part for us actually sort of shown out is where the Hakdarshaks in the field um, actually went to these people, help them do the seeding, even logged on to internet banking and net banking or, you know, made accounts that were then linked to their BOCW cards. Because we said if the preparedness is not there and we don't know how the pandemic is going to pan out, it's going to be very different. One of the most important things actually uh, that we saw was, you know, how working directly with some of the employers and construction companies helped this. Um, we started our first such model with, you know, Godridge um, almost four years ago now. Um, and what we told them was, look, we will set up kiosks at the center, at, at where the construction worker is working right outside the labor camp. Uh, what that does is this person doesn't have to figure out things. All of them get done by 7.30 p.m. After that, to go to the city and, you know, get access is, is, is a very, very logistical and a very realistic problem. Um, so I think that is that is one of the turning points of our operating model. Where we said that we will work at the place, at the destination of the of the work, uh, you know, because that is where most of the problems lie. Um, and I think I would, again, this, this topic is uh, all of us, are, I think, very passionate and hence here and just like a never ending um, sort of discussion. But I think there are very, very basic logistical issues that first need addressing uh, before even sort of going to questions like, hey, is the thousand rupees payout even enough um, in, 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 a, in a country that, you know, is seeing a, a high inflation rate and prices are rising every day? That's actually secondary. But our experience really shows that this assistance where it is needed um, is today a problem and hence just sort of developing end-to-end -end digital things like eShram today is all digital. 60% um, of the construction workers have a feature phone. Um, so what are they going to do? Are they going to walk up to a CSE, find out a cyber cafe and for what? Uh, right. So will they give a day's wage for, for all this because there's nothing direct? So I think we are trying to be that link uh, in the assisted part of it. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about more as we as we go through. Thanks, thanks, Madhura. And and I mean, the the point on uh, you know inadequate service delivery also ties up to what Dr. Kale had talked about. That while we have the mechanism in place, uh, the last um, you know the, the 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 last intermediary, so to say, uh, you know they really uh, do not have. A clue of how the say the SOPs uh, around things work and how exactly do we facilitate um, all this to to the beneficiary? Um, but at the same time, I mean, uh, there's there's a very interesting point that you had raised on the role of employers and how exactly they can work uh, with um, you know social enterprises in 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 delivering these services. So I think we have kind of, as, as Dr. Kale had said, we had expanded the scope uh, from banking agents to social enterprises and employers. And right, on that note, we have uh, Samana Tejani from Gets Food with us. And Samana is the director of Gets Food, which is one of the oldest pioneers in prepackaged food in India. And Gets Food is also a part of the Dasra Social Compact Initiative. Uh, so Samana, like drawing from your experience as an employer, and your involvement with the workers, uh, how has COVID really uh, molded your relationship with your workers and how do you envision uh, their welfare? So um, first, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to listen to people like this because you know, when you're in the business sector, sometimes you forget that there's a lot more happening on the background. So thank you for, for having me on the panel because I've already learned something from, from being here. Um, but uh, so, you know, for us, actually, we are, uh, we have actually had a pretty good communication with our workforce pre-COVID. Um, uh, we are a 98% female driven workforce. So, um, it, I mean, that on its own presents a few challenges and has modified the way that we really work, right? So um, just to give you guys a few examples, if you look at um, the first, you know, if, if you remember the first food inflation that happened in India, uh, people were really badly hit and it was just, you know, prices were going through the roof. We were finding it even harder, the company, which is when like within the family, we had a discussion of, you know, we're finding it so hard to, to keep up with the increasing prices, what's happening to our workforce. 
um, and the initiative was sort of taken on to you know have a conversation with them and uh, my dad propagated us to do this and he said you know find out what's going on and on finding out we were devastated that there really was no food in these people's house and we're a food company right you can't it was not something we could ignore um, so we started and we said that you know let us start giving one vegetable every day to the entire workforce and it should feed a family of four um, so enough that it's not going to spoil but enough that they're full um, and we started with that. So it started, I think, first almost three days a week. Then it went to every day. Now it's at two vegetables every day, um, right? But when we started the initiative also, we started giving this away. And then we, you know, there was a conversation again with my father saying, yes, you're giving the vegetables very good, but go back and find out whether there is any more room to do this. You know, are, are we targeting the right problem? Um, so, you know, we're family business, my sister's there, I'm there and our senior management team got together and they went back to talk to the, the workers. Turned out where we were staying, there were still three or four major drains that were happening on the company. Oh, uh, sorry, on the, on the workforce. One was peanuts, second was jaggery, third was oil and the fourth was transport. Um, so the first three were things we could tackle immediately, right? We knew these were things we could do. So we got down to doing it and we said that let us like include that in the distribution program and um, we and we did that so uh, the thing to remember through all of this is because the the conversation was with the workers we were able to tackle the right problems wasn't that you know we were saying we are going to give you free solar lights and they needed something completely different so uh, so our conversation with them has always been pretty uh, pretty good and you know pretty open in terms of what they need versus what the company is capable of doing for them um, the other thing that happened during that time is when we sort of announced this program to our oil suppliers they gave it to us at subsidized rates so uh, and said you know for your distribution program this is the rate you'll get for us to buy as a company it is a different rate that we pay obviously market prices but for this particular program they joined hands with us so uh, that for us worked out really great. The other thing that happened post COVID for us is because there was a lot of sort of uh, you know communication happening with things that we should be paying attention to. There were programs that came uh, into being. So one of them, like you mentioned, is the social compact initiative. Uh, you know that focuses on six. I'm sure you all all know this, but the six key health uh, key areas, and they came on to do a site visit now. What I find very often in industry is that, you know, we don't have a lot of the information that people have that are on this panel, right? Uh, that there are all these schemes available, that they should be applying for it. Um, those kind of things are not stuff we generally have access to. So for us, social compact was a huge sort of, you know, push in the right direction to say, this is what we can do. So we, you know, we are a, um, it, it's almost a joint effort for everybody to do this. So they have a facilitation center with the mobile unit now that is going to come to the factory and talk about different schemes that are available um, and how they really will come up with you know what they need to do and how they need to do it we've had one experience during de demonetization uh, when we used to pay the workers in cash pre-demonetization uh, and being a female workforce uh, you know a large chunk of them have abuse uh, come from abusive households so being paid in cash was a huge thing for them because they could maneuver how much money they wanted to keep available, you know, to the husband, so to speak, and how much they needed to hide. There used to be people who used to come and say, please don't give us all the money. You keep this. I will come and take it from you tomorrow. Um, when Demon hit, we had to legally overnight change it to, uh, to digital banking. And when we asked for bank account numbers, there was a huge uproar at the factory saying, please don't do this because almost everybody's bank accounts were their husband's. And if they were not for the husband, they were linked to the husband's mobile. So they were in very bad places at that point because people's incomes had dropped as soon as we started sending it to the bank accounts. We said, no, you know, we, we have to tackle this in some way. And uh, we, we joined hands with the bank and with an agent to get the Aadhaar cards completed, to get their things linked. Now, we don't have a lot of migrant labor, like interstate migrant labor, but we have some labor that has moved to Pune because... They've gotten married and moved here and things like that. So, you know, okay, where is your ancestral home? Can you at least get, get us that address proof if this one is not possible? Uh, and we started linking their Aadhaar cards and doing all that so that then the bank account could be linked and tried to do whatever we could in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that at least it's in their name and they are the only people capable of withdrawing whatever money needs to be withdrawn from there. 
so that was an initiative that we took on to do it so like we said we brought them into the formal banking sector we have a long way to go compared to what needs to be done but these are like little things that have happened for us so now most of our workforce is has their own bank accounts um that they have done when we started the vegetable program one of the effects we saw was you know that uh, we do health checks for our workers every year uh, the hemoglobin counts went up the year that we started the program so i think that as employers one it's really important for us to know you know there are problems we need to tackle and to have this sort of transparent approach uh, top down and bottom up uh, you have to be willing to listen in order to see what feedback they are willing to give uh, and that i think that we had that pretty well figured out pre pandemic as well um there is what the pandemic has done for us besides you know obviously bringing social compact was because of these conversations and that's actually how we got into social compact also one of the things was my sister had attended the dasra talk for migrant labor and we were building a plant at that time and when she came back she spoke to me about it and she said that you know why don't you go talk to the construction people about what are the living conditions for these workers what is going to happen can we like mandate a few things can we do that they were not even questions that had ever occurred for me to ask that you know this is what we did but we had a meeting we spoke to our contractor it was maybe too late in the day for us to make a lot of changes but we made some and now we know that hiring a contractor will now involve a whole new set of questions that we will ask before we hire somebody uh so i think that that has been the change really for us to see what's going on but i feel like just one additional thing i talk about is where you are talking about assisted assisted tech right we have also had the same experience because we wanted to do a vaccine drive at the um at the company and the first thing that happened when we did that is you know we announced that everybody has to register and the immediate feedback was how um so we said okay gun bhadi just get your mobiles and come to work and we will do it so our hr team sort of headed that up and they did all 600 and their families registrations and then we started the vaccination program um uh, so i think that that was also something that you know caught my attention but i think that that is a huge need of the hour and hopefully we will find ways to address this uh, you know even for the as employers and get people more in tune with what needs to be done it's a long winded answer but i hope i answered your question No, no, no. That was that was pretty comprehensive. Uh, what was interesting was also, uh, you know, discussing about uh, these uh, facilitation and how employers can really, um, uh, you know, escalate that facilitation to to their own workers. So, uh, just going back to Madhura and Madhura's point, now that we have a perspective uh, from the employers as well, um, where do you think can and and what is the nature of the collaboration that can be done between the employers and uh, social enterprises to set up these facilitation centers, or or if there is uh, you know something beyond that we can do. Uh, from the facilitation centers as well right i think uh, a couple of points that we've been sort of also internally discussing at handarsha um is that most of the times because the employment duration of most of these workers and purely from an informal perspective is very short right the visibility that a worker enters today is going to be working on the in this factory or in this construction site for the next 6 months is not there with anyone so it's a very very short sort of thing because most of them will move on to some other site next next month and the contractors are the ones who really have the power honestly to do any kind of work or any kind of influencing with with this um uh, i think today most employers look at you know basic kyc like you know bank account aadhar card pan card as a must when they when they employ people typically from this pg a couple of things that can be looked at is can we also look at mandatory state sponsored insurances or um, mandatory central insurances right there are 12 rupee 333 rupee sort of premiums there and even if they are not part of the formal sector like you and i are where our employers are mandated to give us some kind of a social protection in terms of health insurance can we then look at having facilitators provide the government part of it if the employer doesn't want to sort of bear that cost right and can that be a part of the formal joining checklist um if it's a construction worker can we ensure that everyone is a part of the bocw board in the particular state um if it is a normal factory worker with a lot of women 
then how about the maternity benefits that the state and the center has i think purely looking from how do we actually leverage this public sort of fund better via private public and sort of you know intermediaries is ex extremely essential and to uh, giving giving that sort of you know buy in through all layers of management a lot of times what happens is decision makers want to do it but like i said on a construction site the contractor is a decision maker if he does not let his sort of you know crew out for 10 minutes to just sign up for a scheme uh, then there's no point in even you know sitting there full day and we've seen that it's a reality or uh, they charge them by an hour right so mm. how do we make how do we institutionalize it uh, can we make it as part of you know so what we do is we, we we are a part of mandatory safety trainings in most factories and construction sites what that gives us is direct access and people do come to the training because it's a compliance issue for the company so they're going to do that uh, why do why not look at social security like a compliance and have that mandatory sort of fed in uh, because that will only institutionalize give some structure to what we are doing um, and have that and the second point is you know there's always a question of okay you know but who pays for all this um if there is a facilitator even a csc center today will charge you a facilitation fee what we have seen what works is typically having some buy in from the worker himself or herself right so if there could be a co contribution from the employer but let the worker also decide for himself and herself what is it that i want to do do i want a scholarship for my daughter or do, do my parents in the how you know back home want a pension if i want to get that facilitated am i ready to pay a 20 30 rupee charge so that i don't have to travel and it will save my 100 rupees the employer here then is just a channel to give that sort of access to intermediary so i think there are a couple, two points here how do we institutionalize then how do we look at cost and you know how do we sort of balance that yeah yeah no that's a that's a great point i mean uh, talking about costs uh, as well and uh, as you had said about you know the basic kyc documents like aadhar and especially pan uh, which most of the workers lack i just um, you know i would just move to uh, samana to ask you know how do how how do you think that uh, you know this collaboration uh, i mean what is the scope or potential of this area in, of collaboration uh, in order to have the last mile or address the last mile uh, delivery access i think that that would be i mean that's the only way to do it in my opinion right uh, that if if industry doesn't get on board with this there's there is no other last mile delivery mechanism besides getting us to say you know become more responsible for what we are doing um and i think you you are right about that that there is you know unless say for example now i know that a lot of times this happens that the you know the people at the top want to do it but then how does it trickle down but there are certain times where it just has to be mandated from the top right that this look this needs to be done and we have to get on board with it but also more importantly i think that sometimes we forget to have conversations with the rest of the stakeholders the the cdr most management will only forget to do it that look this is what we want to do how do we all connect and make sure that this gets done so for example if i had to just take uh, the example from you madhura i i know that it is a phone call i will make before we sign our next construction worker right that uh, construction work that look these are our requirements for you to work with us uh, before your construction starts we want to make sure all the cards are in place we want to we want to do all of this and then of course the cost factor is bound to come up that you know you are asking for this much compliance who's going to pay for that uh, which is where there's going to be there's going to be a conversation that needs to had between the construction crew and us because look at the end of the day while we are talking about this only from a standpoint of you know it's the right thing to do um the world has moved ahead in terms of what they are mandating people to start doing um so for example if i had to just give you one we started supplying for major retailer in the us and the first thing that they asked us to do was a social audit that was the basis of our supply um right if you fail that audit you cannot supply to them um and it wasn't what i realized was it wasn't a lot of uh you know what are the great practices you are doing it was more about do you abide by the law in your country right are you only an 8 hour work day only 2 hours work overwork do you pay your overtime correctly do you do those things correctly so it's not very far away where the rest of what everybody is talking about will get intervened into us and it will become a mandated procedure um 
for for things to happen so before it becomes mandated the idea is for industry to jump in and say let's do it now um and kind of you know get going the other is i think that things like social compact and people who have been talking at the panel is hagdasha or, or indicus if there is a way for for industry to find out more about these kind of tools and you know uh, have people come over see i don't think we would ever be able to build in the um the infrastructure to have people like this on our role or doing this all the time but we definitely have the infrastructure to contact these people and say hey let's set up camp um over you know over at the industry so i think that that's that's really the future of how this is going to pan out according to me yeah yeah uh thank you so much samana uh, i think that yeah you have <laughs> you know given us a wholesome perspective of things especially from the employer's perspective which is mostly missing from discussions um but what we hear see and deriving from uh, dr kalaj and madhuras and your um, comments as well is that there is still an entanglement of uh technology and technological innovation and intermediaries in this entire process they really can't uh, go uh, you know isolated from each other um so uh, i i would want madhuri from uh, in this action uh, to to elaborate more on it uh, because she has uh, done centered her work around the systems reform through policy and grounded research so um uh madhuri how has covid really defined uh, the welfare infrastructure for last mile delivery and where do you exactly see the tech and the intermediaries coming in uh, the ecosystem thanks chitra and uh, thank you to everyone else who shared before very interesting conversation and samana i think very uh, something that that resonated a lot with me is the fact that we need to really have conversations with the people we're working with and i think uh, kudos to you for starting to do that at least so yeah, i think we need more of that moving forward uh, when we talk of like welfare infrastructure i think something that i would want to focus on is like the safety nets for our most vulnerable families not only for and one of those groups within the vulnerable families are uh, migrant workers i'm not going to go into the issues that we saw during covid because they've already some of them have been highlighted the only point i'd make there is that from pre covid to the first wave to the second wave what we saw was that there was a change in uh, the requirements that families were facing right then the first wave we i mean pre covid migrant workers primarily were a forgotten group as we've spoken of that they weren't quite uh, highlighted for anyone because they weren't being counted anywhere um, but post covid like for during the first wave i think from transportation to ration requirements to healthcare livelihoods there's been a change in the requirements that the families have had on the, on ground and so if we talk of like five specific areas which are connected to the implementation of social protection that tie into technology the first one is that it's geography specific we've seen that there are no rights or schemes that are transferable interstate and a lot of them are not even transferable intrastate so when we're talking of welfare provisions that the government is providing primarily uh, they're not transferable rights the one nation one ration that dr kali mentioned is started off as in nine states as a pilot so far and we've not seen it scale up in the other uh, states too so far. the second thing is around documentation requirements that already madhura has touched upon samana has as well that there are umpteen number of documents required to access welfare provisions and it's often the same documents that are repeated for multiple uh, rights as well um there they are i mean their identity proof there are if you look at like rt section 121c it requires an identity proof a date of birth proof and address proof all of which could be the aadhar card right that you just need one aadhar card which incidentally actually sits within the government database itself so we are asking people to provide a uh, an identity proof that the government has created for them of which they already like so the government already has this we are asking people to again provide it in three times over to access one right and this i'm talking about one specific provision for one person uh when we look at an entire family they possibly need to provide multiple documents for that family to access the different rights and not all of them are again in one tranche right or in one at one go that they receive the benefit so documentation is one huge issue and the uh, aadhar seeded the jam 
piece that Dr. Kali mentioned is something that is a huge challenge when it comes to documents, the Jandhan, Aadhaar, and the mobile connection. The third piece is the nature of welfare, right? So there's either in-kind uh, welfare provision or cash transfers. So there are CCTs like conditional cash transfers or direct benefit transfers. Uh, provision of bicycles to school students would be an in-kind provision and the 500 per month under the Jandha Yojana is an example of the DBT. The fourth piece in this is the role of frontline workers, right? So the frontline workers, currently the workforce of the government that's there on the ground are uh, ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers, or the healthcare workers, which are the ANMs. There. Now, these are uh, overburdened and expected to perform the delivery of a lot of welfare provisions on the ground, right? So that's the fourth piece. And then the fifth piece, I think, is the divisions with, within vulnerability as well. So if we're looking at welfare provision, we're looking at it being provided to people of different genders, different castes, uh, very different economic divides, literacy, rural urban divide, you know, so financial and digital literacy, again, is very different in all of these subsections and subgroups. So the women of what you were mentioning, uh, I think what Samana was mentioning of having bank accounts for women specific thing would fall under this particular category. And the number of intermediaries in this are way too many for us to count, right? So if I just broadly categorize them, we're looking at the governments, which are the union government and the state government. And then within the state, the different divisions that come in. Uh, then the civil society players, like a lot of us sitting here, uh, NGOs, CSOs, organizations uh, out to do this work. And then very importantly, the people who are sort of forgotten from the entire conversation are the families. So the actual citizens who are to receive this welfare are the ones that are forgotten from the conversation of what do they need, where are the gaps that they are facing, and uh, how should we bring them in. So those are the intermediaries. And a challenge that we identified through all five of these streams that I mentioned right now is in some way technology, right? So I'm, I'll just bring a link to these five things that I mentioned. Uh, there is no common database currently that is being shared across departments in a state, across states in uh, the country. There is no common denominator that tracks a family right now. There are states which have started creating family databases. There are multiple states that have started doing that. So Haryana with its par, uh, Parivar Pehchan Patra or Tamil Nadu started with a state family database. There are states which have started creating these infrastructures to capture a family's trajectory overall. But there isn't a very successful running model in the country at all of where a family is being tracked where all of the welfare provisions for that family are being tracked, where their current uh, social economic standing, where their migration is being tracked, none of it. And so we are not able to see the kind of welfare that is being provided from the states to any um, family currently. And we're also at individual levels as well. There aren't databases that are robust enough to track individuals within all of the departments that we talk of. So even for BOCW that uh, Madhura was mentioning, which is the B Building and Other Construction Workers Act, and there, which looks at the organized sector of construction workers, then UOW is the Unorganized Workers uh, Act, and then there are domestic workers, et cetera. These don't exist in any of our databases. We had no idea of how many migrant workers there were when, we, uh, when the pandemic hit, right? There was no one universally accepted number. So that is one major issue. What that is leading to is a lot of inclusion and exclusion errors at different levels, right? So there are uh, families, and we saw this divide primarily a lot in like rural and urban areas, as well as tribal, hilly regions, so geography specific, where we could see that there were certain families who knew how to get access to one, right? Had access to 20 other schemes and welfare provisions as well. And then there was a family who did not know how to get access to a single, right? And they did not have access to any of them. And so when we talk of inclusion errors, uh, where there are some who are getting more than the others, it's also to do with the fact that there isn't awareness on the ground. Um, and that also the state isn't targeting rightly enough. So possibly the bottom 25% is not being targeted by anybody because they don't exist very clearly in a database that shows that, okay, these are the people who are getting access and these aren't. So technology there could be extremely beneficial and useful in uh, mapping out the population of the state in itself. Then when we look at um, 
the next sort of piece with technology is something that I agree with what a lot of the speakers have already said is that there has to be a hybrid or sort of mixed model with technology. So tech isn't the end, it's rather a means to the end, right? So we need to make sure that we look at it as that. Just putting in a tech system in place is not going to resolve everything. What it does is relieves some of the burden on the different intermediaries we've been speaking about. One example that I'd like to give you, and uh, when we talk of the frontline workers, we were doing uh, an ME study in Delhi when the pandemic hit. And there was, because we started getting complaints that the Panjiri and Moongfali, which is something that is delivered as part of the ICBS uh, program in Delhi, was not getting delivered to the uh, women that it was intended for. And one of the key reasons we realized is that, I mean, one where tech was useful was that calls during the pandemic couldn't go on the ground. So just setting up a helpline, doing those calls, analyzing that data, all of that is like some one version of technology. But we realized that the frontline workers had to carry those 20 kilos of uh, whatever they were delivering from the first household as they moved down to the last household. Now the solution was very simple to provide them an e-rickshaw possibly, or to provide them something that would go into the smaller uh, gullies that they were in. But that didn't come about at all because nobody had spoken to them. Because there wasn't a mechanism set up earlier which could sort of inform where the loops or gaps were. And so setting up a helpline and dashboards to quickly reflect that, do rapid uh, m and &E cycles, really help in getting to the root of a problem that was very easily solved. So that was one usage of technology as a means to quickly identify a problem and work with that. The other uh, utility that we've seen of technology in the more recent past is to do with pilfering. So when there are multiple number of intermediaries at play, right? So if I have to set up a bank account, I will possibly need to give 50 rupees to somebody to set up a bank account for me because I don't know how to. I don't know how to access that. Um, my husband, more often than not, might have that. So if I have to get a SIM card, get my mobile link, et cetera, and I don't know how to, that's one challenge. CSC said, oh, sorry, CSC centers, choice centers, or uh, you know, internet cafes, et cetera, end up charging a lot of money to do the same. And uh, we realized that by setting up government-aided technology centers, so having places where people could go to the government offices themselves and get things so from like application from understanding eligibility actually to then applying and to actually then getting the welfare, whatever that might be in person or uh, in cash, that could be aided very easily with the help of tech because it made the process more transparent. So now there is a check at every level of who's actually filling out that form, who is uh, working on it. There are multiple issues with it, no doubt. Like I won't say that that's, you know, a bed of roses and everything's great because we've seen that to where people have filled out forms offline when they get transferred online there's a lot of uh, loss transmission loss in that but still it's an improve improvement over the system that exists right now and I mean, given the size of our country I think that's the best that we can do for the current uh, at least to move to the next step All right I will pause now Chitra just so that you have yeah uh, yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, it really ties to our next panel, um, whatever you have discussed, Madhuri, especially on uh, the limitations of the schemes uh, within as we say, within the design of these schemes, how limiting uh, they are. And um, yeah, also, you know, the, the, the transferability, interoperability of these schemes. Um, I think uh, we, I mean, before we move on, if there are any questions uh, among the audience, you can always drop them to the Q&A window. Uh, we will take it up uh, at the towards the end, right? Right. Uh, so, yeah, as we talk about service delivery, we have uh, Arushi with us from Dwara Research, who has worked extensively on uh, grievance redressal and uh, scheme delivery, welfare scheme delivery and their design. So, uh, Arushi, I think it will be interesting to know from you as well. And, you know, as to how, I mean, the... the the entire ecosystem works and how, you know, we, where exactly do we see the challenges and the exclusion bits uh, panning out? Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chitra. Um, also, the conversation so far has been so comprehensive. So please do excuse any repetitions that might just happen. Um, but broadly, I'm coming um, 
from a very research perspective. So over the last two years, the Social Protection Initiative at Dwara Research has really developed a conceptual and an empirical approach to really document some of these exclusionary factors that all the other panelists have highlighted. So what we do is we, the focus of our research has been around direct benefit transfers and within DBT, we know there are inside and in cash transfers, but we primarily look at the cash transfers bit where the money is being transferred from the consolidated fund or the state consolidated fund right down to the beneficiaries bank accounts. So a very complicated, although standardized protocol of uh, transferring money to National Payments Corporation of India, you have UIDAIS involved and you know, into the mix, you can throw in a plethora of other stakeholders as well. And what we see is that since 2013-14, up until now, there are approximately 310 schemes in total that the DVD scheme delivers. And what we see is that the iterative error-reducing mechanisms that have been deployed by both the union government and the state governments have come at a cost. Sure, inclusion errors have reduced. You have Aadhaar that allows deduplication of beneficiaries, etc. But it has Nonetheless, made delivery extremely cumbersome. A huge cohort of introduction of technology. It sort of initiates a, that is under the purview of only the union government and maybe the state government has some say in it. But the local government functionaries that are sitting in villages, that are sitting in wards, they have very little visibility or very little management of the data. Right. So at the end of the day, what initiation of technology, the consequent centralization of processes does it at the end of the day, it disempowers the very stakeholder it was meant to support. So we've seen that the citizen state interface that is increasingly being digitized has really made a lot of people difficult to navigate the system. Right. And here is the question of intermediaries coming up where We've seen across all the three, four projects that we've undertaken with India Migration now, with Hug Tarshak, with Gramvani, which is again a social tech platform. We've seen that social workers and civil society organizations play a huge role. It could be in the form of correcting your other details. It could be in the form of simply doling out information that would sort of weaponize you to go ahead and navigate the grievance redress me mechanism itself, right? So taking a step back and to see at a very system level, how do we really document these exclusion errors? So we can imagine the delivery chain of direct benefit transfers as something divided into four stages, right? So you have the pre-entry stage, which is where eligibility is determined, who gets money and who doesn't, right? And it's usually based on some vulnerability indicator that you have. It could be based on your occupation status, your income, whether you're an OBC, SC, SC, et cetera. Once that's done, comes the entry stage, right, enrollment stage, where you have to prove that, yes, I fit the criteria that you've established under the eligibility rules. And given that how narrow our targeting methodologies have been, they've either primarily based on the socioeconomic caste census that was conducted 10 years ago, and it's completely outdated and doesn't even include the number of families and beneficiaries have fallen back into the poverty line in 2020 and 2021, what we see is that there is an, there's a lot of inaccurate targeting. Assuming that even if the database was updated, what is the robust, what is the methodology that you've used to identify these people, right? So there, again, the two-pronged issue. Is your formula to calculate the poverty line accurate, right? And even the survey administrators or the enumerators that you sent out in the villages, did they cover every nook and corner? Did they cover the homeless? Did they cover people who were living in remote hamlets, right? So targeting all in all the unequivocal verdict is that it has been inaccurate, right? And the, the main path forward is to have self-enrollment, self-identification, and to some so form of uh, movement um, towards the targeting of the right. Moving on to the enrollment stage. Now, yes, Chitra, Arshi, I think we are losing the you. Yeah, there's a problem yeah. with the but, Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I'm getting an error notification as well. Is this better though? I'll just turn off my video and you can let me know. Does this help? Okay, great. Yeah, that's better. Okay, great. Okay, so moving on to the enrollment stage and what we really see is that the narrower the targeting methodology, the stringent and the more cumbersome is the enrollment stage, right? Because the onus is now on the citizen to prove uh, their eligibility. And that's usually 
it's happening in the form of furnishing some kind of a physical identity card it could be the bpl card it could be the ration card right over and above these documentation requirements and what you will see as i think madhur madhuri also pointed out that documentation requirements have been extremely uh, uh, sort of penalizing for a lot of citizens not only in terms of that you require multiple visits for instance if i am a farmer and i want to register under pm kisan i want to get my land holding documents approved by the local patwari or the local tehsildar the sheer number of running around from pillar to post that it entails right the patwari is not available the patwari is simply denying signing my documents etc that itself becomes such a taxing exercise for the beneficiary that we've seen a lot of people simply quit during the process and not go ahead with you know paying so much paying a bribe that might be being demanded etc etc so around if i just if i highlight the recent results that we've gotten from a survey around 28% of the people did flag that this is a major issue so and specifically 19% of them are saying that even if i'm unable to procure even if i'm able to procure a document sorry there are errors in that documentation that again would inevitably make my registration invalid right now assuming somehow you are registered under the scheme the next stage comes with its own set of issues which is the benefit processing stage and while there is a well defined protocol of how the money is transferred from uh, the consolidated fund of india to the sponsor bank to the destination bank etc etc there is still a high degree of opacity in the status of the transfer so when once a beneficiary who isn't getting any payment approaches let's say the common service center where they had registered the common service center is unable to track their payments that's what we've seen at max which is if i take the example of one of the most transparent schemes so far which is pm kisan it at least gives you a reason for failure when was the last installment but most other schemes do not have that kind of information transparency information disbursement right even if there is a dashboard available there is a lack of depth of the information right so it would simply say that the payment has failed but as to the communication of the reason and the communication of the resolution pathway that the citizen has to take is completely missing and which is where again the role of intermediaries come civil society organizations who know how to navigate the system who know what the procedures are they have their connects with the senior government officials so we we suddenly see moving into a very informal domain right we abandon all these official norms and rules and we start collaborating with civil society workers local officials you know as as a lot of literature points out to the paraviker or the rural fixer that exists in a lot of villages who are really trying to connect the citizen and the state now within the disbursement stage itself and just to quickly quickly summarize the number of issues we've seen and something that's already been highlighted by the panelist there are spelling errors in aadhar details there are issues related to improper seeding of aadhar with the bank account as madhra pointed out there's also a sheer mismatch of aadhar and bank account details so we've seen in a lot of instances uh, in villages in madhya pradesh where the application form has the aadhar number of one person and bank account number of person b right and and the patwari has accepted the application because he or she will earn a commission on accepting the application so it's not so it's not really up to the patwari to flag these issues it's only once the application is submitted it goes right up to the level of state government where they flag that oh no this is an inclusion error it seems like a dubious issue i'm not going to register this person right the next issue is about pending kyc which i think we've covered quite well the last issue is frozen and blocked bank accounts and this is a very clear transmission of banking infrastructure or banking apparatus problems into the domain of social protection we've seen that for a lot of uh, individuals especially those belonging to low income households informal sector they they are not the account usage has been low or sub optimal right so we might have cracked the entry problem of financial inclusion that is now everybody has bank accounts but have we cracked the usage problem we are far from that goal right and because of this a lot of banks do these frequent exercises of cleaning their database so whichever account hasn't been used regularly or there is very little minimum account they simply freeze or block those accounts and while the ministry of finance has said that you cannot sort of decline crediting of a bank account simply based on frozen or blockage most banks continue to do the practice all right so that's that's the third stage issue 
assuming, let's say, that you somehow manage to bypass all these issues and the money does in fact come into your bank account, the next set of issues that you have to reckon with is how to get this money into your hands, right? And this is where we come to the typical problems of last mile cash in, cash out networks, right? Which has uh, very well been covered for last uh, a, a decade or so, right? But we still see we've in, we've introduced payments banks, we've introduced the BC network, etc. But the cash out challenges continue to persist. So in the latest survey that we've done in this, we covered Andhra Pradesh, Assam, and Chhattisgarh, and we interviewed around fifteen hundred citizens. Fifty percent of the sample told us that the cash out point for us is very far away, and this sample also includes beneficiaries from maternity schemes, right? So they are. These are women who've recently delivered or are currently pregnant, and they simply flag that I can't go and walk up to the cash out point and provide my biometrics, right? So these are issues that are yet to be solved in the last mile. Apart from cash out point being far away, assume that you've even managed to access one. You've uh, you've taken a bus, you've borrowed a motorcycle, which is what we've seen, and you approach the bank branch or you approach the BC. We've seen instances of erratic availability, that BC ek din waha pe betha tha, but it's not there anymore, right? So that erratic availability continues to persist. Assuming that finally you have a working BC in sight, then comes the set of operational issues, right? That uh, are my biometrics going to fail? Is there a network error? Is the POS device not functioning well? So that set of issues that you have to reckon with. Assuming all of this goes well, there is another category of issues that continues, which is non-compliance on the part of banking officials, right? And we've seen these instances of petty corruption, petty fraud, where either the BC is overcharging you, whether the banking officials are demanding some sort of cut from the wage that you've gotten from the MG and RDGA, for instance, right? So this is the whole ecosystem of issues, I would say, when it comes to exclusionary factors. And a stage-wise typological view has really helped us uh, sort of launch some of these surveys and really measure the extent of each of these issues. Coming to some of the pathways, uh, we've seen, so there are two to three methodologies or strategies that any state government or unit government can deploy, right? So one is, of course, the long-term strategies of infrastructure and capacity building, which typically have a long gestation period that you increase the number of CSEs, you increase the number of bank branches, et cetera, et cetera. You train your personnel and whatnot, right? Uh, till the cows come home. But what do you do in the short term? In the short term, you need to institute grievance to address mechanisms that until the bigger big ticket issues are addressed, at least a citizen should have a way to enter back into the system. And what would a grievance to address, a robust grievance to address look like? As Madhra mentioned, Madhuri mentioned, it has to be a hybrid model. You need to have some institutionalized partnership with CSOs and social workers and any other organization that's working in this area. Second, you also need to make sure that these last mile functionaries have the functional capacity, right? So the CSC operator should be able to register your complaints, should be able to tell you what is the status of that complaint, given that all the GRMs right now are completely digitized, right? Even the IVR mechanism that we have where, you know, you call an old helpline number and you dial, at least in 2020 and 2021, all the calls that I've made as proxy just to see whether they're working or not, none of those helplines really work, right? So that's another issue altogether to crack. Um, the last thing is also, there aren't any clear rules of accountability. So if my bank account and my Aadhaar seeding is the problem, then who do I really approach to? The bank officials direct me to the block development officer. The block development officer pushes me back to the CSE, right? And this entire pillar to post not only results in absolute exhaustion and sort of opportunity cost, uh, has implications for the money you're spending on this exercise, right? And which in a lot of cases might simply be disproportionate to the benefit you're struggling all of this for. So, sorry, I think I'm getting another error message. Chitra, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You can go okay, ahead, Arishi. Great. great, can you give me a time check though? Um, yeah, so the 10 minutes are up. You can continue for a minute or two. Okay, great. So I'll just quickly conclude with uh, something I think uh, 
we can take up for later discussion as well but it's the model that andhra pradesh is currently following so in 2019 it was really bias ready who launched this village secretariat village volunteer or ward volunteer method where all these volunteers are on the state government's payroll they're being paid 5000 rupees as honorarium and they are responsible for the end to end of the delivery chain so you enroll people you disperse or you hand them over their pension amounts or their ration and you also go door to door and register complaints or address their grievances on the spot if possible right and this is an extremely useful important model because it sort of deviates from this whole public private partnership model right it keeps there's no outsourcing of delivery that's happening right monitoring becomes easier because the village volunteers are directly reporting to a government official and in this case it's a village secretariat and we also see that in a lot of instances given that there is an honorarium involved which is not necessarily the case in csc so csc's or vles village level entrepreneurs the the they never get a, a a capital infusement when they're setting up the csc right they work on commissions and a big problem in csc's has been them breaking even something that we haven't seen in the case of village volunteers yet but we do see some issues related to for instance if a volunteer is serving a tribal hamlet then the 5000 rupees becomes sort of insufficient so that kind of a configuration of incentives in monitoring is something that has to be cracked when it comes to deploying these grievance to address officers yeah with that i'll conclude yeah, thank you so much arushi for laying it out for us so well and uh, yeah now that we see the loopholes within design and the last mile access um i would and and given that the panel in itself is so polyphonic so i would want kunal to come in and reflect on the experiences with different kinds of stakeholders given all that uh, we have uh, discussed already and so kunal leads the research and research operations vertical at policy and development advisory group which is again a social enterprise uh, specializing in policy advisory social research and strategic uh, communications so uh, kunal noting on the conversation of collaboration how has uh, pdag safe and responsible uh, migration initiative really approached this issue of last mile delivery given all the challenges and what has been the experience or the range of experiences must i say uh, with different stakeholders over to you kunal right hey, thank you chitra uh, i mean first uh, for inviting me on behalf of the policy and development advisory group to highlight the work being done under the safe and responsible migration initiative in jhatpur uh, before i get to answer your question please allow me to set the context uh, so uh, during the pandemic induced lockdown in uh, 2020 uh, we worked in tandem with the chief minister of jharkhand and other top bureaucrats including the office of the chief secretary during this period while our focus uh, was to get the migrant workers back safely Uh, the medium term response was to generate employment opportunities within the state to absorb this workforce uh, deliberating on whatever was going around us and the kind of images that we all saw during that period we felt that there was need for an institutional institutional framework uh, for the workers along with the need for a long term policy response uh, a lot of work uh, was being done within the migration ecosystem and we at pdag uh, through srmi are uh, aimed to demonstrate a collective action approach where institutions work together to address the issues of last mile delivery uh, faced by the migrant workers uh, and in order to create a robust policy framework to strengthen safe and responsible migration uh, by reducing vulnerabilities uh, distress and exploitation uh, for workers in jharkhand we built a consortium with policy and development advisory group as the lead partner along with center for migration and inclusive development which has been doing uh, some exemplary work over the last few years uh, to address issues of last mile delivery for the migrant workers uh, bharti institute of public policy based out of indian school of business uh, which is providing technical inputs uh, with regards to the initiative and fia foundation uh, which has a network uh, which is spread across 19 states and has a huge csr uh, network across all these states and uh, obviously the department of labor uh, which is uh, implementing this entire initiative and the initiative is housed within the department of labor here in jharkhand and uh, through srmi we uh, aim to address the issues being faced by migrant workers focusing on uh, increased social security and welfare coverage for migrant workers and their families 
through institutional policy and operational frameworks, enabling registration of migrant workers, uh, monitoring and analyzing migrant workers' databases, creating awareness amongst migrant workers through IEC campaigns around safe and responsible migration practices. Along with that, we also aim to uh, build the capacity of the Department of Labor officials vis-a-vis uh, -vis the phenomena of migration to, in order so as to strengthen the implementation side of things. Because the department officials, though they have been working uh, within the government setup for long, they are not per se experts on migration and how to deal with such situations. Uh, so uh, the capacity building exercise is particularly for that purpose uh, within this initiative. Uh, reflecting on the stakeholders that we've been working with, uh, so as I mentioned that uh, we've tried to adopt a collective action approach where every institution is working towards achieving one common goal. Uh, the Chief Minister of Jharkhand on various platforms has expressed his uh, commitment towards the welfare of migrant workers. So our job becomes a whole lot easier when the buy-in is there from the head of the state itself. And it's not only the CM uh, who has bought into this idea, but it's also the departmental minister, the departmental officials uh, who, are, who are all equally enthusiastic and are providing all the required support with regards to the initiative. And uh, in fact, last month, the initiative got the state cabinet approval and now the initiative is a, a official state policy. Uh, in order to ensure last mile delivery, uh, we are piloting three uh, safe and responsible migration centers across three districts of Jharkhand. And the team is coordinating with the local district administration. Uh, and they have, I mean, the district administration has extended its support uh, to establish and operationalize these centers. Uh, in addition to the centers within the districts, we are planning, uh, we are uh, setting up centers across two destination regions as well. So for that, we are having, con we are in conversation with the UP administration of Ladakh and the government of Kerala. So uh, with regards to Ladakh, we've already have, uh, had conversations with the UP administration there and the UP administration has requested us uh, for a proposal to set up this center there. And uh, in Kerala, we are working uh, with CMID uh, to first identify the location uh, that has uh, he, that has a significant number of migrant workers from Jharkhand, and once that's done, we uh, I mean we'll be visiting Kerala and uh, having conversations with the state government and the concerned officials. Uh, the initiative has uh, been recognized at the highest level by Niti Aayog and Dr. K. Rajeshwar Rao, who heads the Labor and Employment Vertical there is uh, following the initiative and he has expressed his desire to see the initiative as a model for the rest of the country to follow. So, and coming to the employer side of things, uh, a big player that we are dealing with is the BRO. So BRO every year takes close to 6,000, 7,000 workers from Jharkhand to work in the border regions of Ladakh as casual paid laborers. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, we uh, uh, organized an air, uh, airlift mission to rescue the workers who were stranded there. So once these workers came back to Jharkhand, the chief minister and our team uh, interacted with these workers. And what we got to know from them was quite shocking uh, that how BRO exploited these workers in the name of nation building. I mean, uh, we were quite surprised to know that there is no uniform wage list for these workers. The cost of warm clothing and uh, the ration that is provided to them is directed from their wages. The quality of shelter that's given to them is quite poor. And uh, in certain cases, they are not even provided compensation for casualties or life-threatening accidents. So once this came to light, uh, the entire BRO uh, thing, the state government sprung into action and multiple rounds of conversations were held with the BRO officials to ensure enhanced wages along with adequate social security uh, benefits for the workers. We got the BRO to sign a terms of reference back in June 2020 uh, with the state government, which stated that the BRO would uh, sign an MOU with the state government and also register as an establishment with the state government. However, despite this repeated, uh, despite this uh, written commitment, uh, they have not till date uh, signed this uh, MOU or registered as an uh, establishment with the state government despite repeated follow-ups. So, that's something to, I mean, that we are still trying to figure out. But the thing here to note is that BRO is a government body, comes under the Ministry of Defense, and this is their attitude towards the migrant workers involved in the process of, I mean, they call, uh, I mean, the how they take migrant workers from here is that the hook is given that they are contributing to the process of nation building. So, and 
then these workers are taken there and they are not even given their dues in terms of uh, how they are contributing in the process of nation building and building critical infrastructure uh, in the border regions. So uh, I hope I have been able to answer you. I'll pause there. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kunal. And uh, while you discuss about your experiences with different stakeholders, uh, where, where and what exactly do you see are the potential areas of innovation which can really help address these issues of last mile delivery? Yeah. Uh, so uh, as uh, Madhuri had mentioned earlier uh, during the conversation that there is uh, no, there is complete lack of any credible data uh, on the number of migrant workers within the country. So this uh, lack of data also had an adverse impact on the implementation of relief and rehabilitation measures for the workers during the lockdown. So in order to address this lack of data around migration and migrant workers, we are in the process of revalidating the migrant workers data that was collected by the state government during the lockdown and understand where these workers are located at present map their skills and also understand the social protection schemes they and their families are availing of. And this revalidation exercise that we, are, uh, that we would be undertaking won't be a one-time exercise. This would be done, that this is something that we do periodically. As what happens usually is that A, migrant workers are definitely mobile, they keep on moving, but they also change their phone numbers quite frequently. So it's very easy to lose track of them. So uh, the idea here is to be in constant touch with them. And in addition to that, we are running a migrant control room here in Jharkhand, which acts as a helpline. And uh, I believe uh, Arushi before me mentioned that she, in her experience, uh, caught, tried a few helplines which do not work. But uh, fortunately, that's not the case here in Jharkhand. The migrant control room here is quite efficient. And uh, so this, the purpose of this helpline is to report for the workers to report cases of distress or exploitation. And the role of the uh, migrant control room becomes all the more uh, important because it reaches out to relevant authorities for providing required support and help to the concerned worker or group of workers whenever there is some situation of distress or exploitation uh, outside the state. More than, I would like to mention here that more than five lakh workers had reached out to the mi migrant control room during the lockdown and even right now, uh, the migrant control room is helping students stuck in Ukraine to return to Jharkhand. Uh, one of the innovations under the initi initiative is to develop interstate coordination mechanisms. We all saw uh, how things played out during the lockdown and there was absolute, uh, there was no communication between states and things were just happening uh, on a daily basis. So in order to avoid such situations, uh, we are uh, looking for, uh, we are in the process of signing, as I mentioned earlier, setting up the SRM centers uh, across states, but we are also uh, looking up to sign MOUs with uh, state governments and also leverage the support of local CSO networks in destination states to ensure accessibility of uh, social welfare schemes and regular monitoring and outreach with the migrant workers in the destination uh, regions. Along with the SRM centers in destination regions, uh, we, as I have already mentioned, that we are setting up uh, three uh, SRM centers within Jharkhand. So the work of these SRM centers would be to map the interstate migrants and their families within the districts, coordinate with the district administration to ensure uh, maximum social security coverage for these uh, for the workers and their families, and also uh, support the local administration to plan IEC uh, campaigns and registration camps for the workers. And we are not looking for, I mean, there will definitely, uh, Madhuri, I believe, again had uh, pointed out that techno how technology should not be the only solution. So here we are very mindful of that fact. And I mean, our experience uh, over the last few years has been that technology uh, in certain places uh, has a restrictive role. So, we are going beyond the role of technology. So when we are talking about having these SRM centers and registration camps for the migrant workers, so these registration camps for the workers would be organized at the panchayat level to register the workers. And in addition to that, there is a uh, there are shamik mitras uh, similar to uh, how it's in Andhra. So these shamik mitras go from uh, all the village volunteers or not the village volunteers, but it's uh, labor uh, labor friends of labor something. I mean loosely 
translate like, uh, it would translate like that so these uh, shramik myths uh, all, would also be involved in the process of registration and tracking of these uh, migrant workers uh, additionally we are also uh, using data from different government schemes like uh, ngnrega uh, pds mission antyode in, com in combination with uh, satellite products like night lights temperature rainfall to develop prediction models to detect the patterns of migration and identify signatures of distress so uh, this we believe would help us uh, to preempt distress migration and the state government can uh, design suitable uh, policy responses uh, based on uh, the i mean whatever this uh, model throws up lastly as part of the initiative we would be conducting a state wide migration survey under the guidance of dr irudhya rajan who has been doing the kerala migration survey since 1998 and the survey we believe would give us insights on the major migration corridors help tag migrant families to various social protection schemes and also help us understand how the pandemic has worsened pre existing vulnerabilities for uh, women and tribal communities in jharkhand the overall findings we believe would help us to design evidence based people centric policies to address welfare issues of migrant workers in the state and uh, with all the work uh, that we are doing under the initiative we hope it will establish establish itself as a model vis-a-vis uh, -vis safe migration practices in the country by initiating a long term policy response positively impacting uh, evidence based uh, knowledge and systemic learnings to inform policy debates on interstate and intrastate migration in india yeah over to you chitra yeah thank you thank you so much kunal for summing it up so well um and uh, yeah i i guess the srm srmi initiative is really looking holistically at how um uh, you know how we understand migration and how to really map migration uh, in the ecosystem uh, i think it's it's been pretty enriching to see how different stakeholders look at uh, the issue of last mile welfare delivery and uh, what the individual problems are there that we are all grappling with but at the same time it's also interesting that we have now we have a place where everyone can come together and a dialogue i hope is initiated uh, somehow as we uh learn from each other and really recognize the scope for cross learning and knowledge exchange within the migration ecosystem as well um and and while we we talk about um exchanging knowledge there's also a lot of grassroots work that we can collaboratively do uh and 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 that is something that i think uh, the social enterprises and the employers can really come together and initiate that conversation and initiate the implementation uh in the field um and and drawing from dr kale's arushi's and uh, madhura's work um we i mean i mean what is becoming clear is we really need a bottom up uh, approach and um, as samana also said there has to be some kind of uh, communication that that clarity in communication has to be achieved for that bottom up approach to work efficiently uh, so now we are open for the question and answer sessions um, and the audience if there are any questions then you can just forward it to the q and a window and i will take the questions from there yeah okay so um yeah this question is uh, addressed to madhuri um uh, so madhuri noting your work with uh, i i don't know who sent in that question but okay um noting your work with states how amenable are stakeholders in recognizing and changing the systems are there any areas where you face challenges in streamlining the processes uh the next question from the same person is to samana actually um wait so samana what are the some of the bot some of the challenges or bottlenecks that you face as an employer in making the processes more worker centric are there any learnings which can be replicated across industry and other employers so uh, we'll take madhuri and then samana so thanks for the question um i think in working across stakeholders and what we've seen 
in our work in about uh, we've been working in 18 states so far and particularly 10 states in terms of social protection over the past two years what we've realized is that uh, there are challenges at different levels of stakeholders obviously right when we're looking at a union government level versus a state versus somebody working on the ground with uh, a few families the perspective changes completely on how you're viewing things so two things which people are amenable to bringing about change but the parameters that really impact it one are budgets is something i think the bottom line of everything comes down to whether there is uh, money to do something or not and that is actually very closely linked to something much bigger which is political will so uh, where there is political will and following it administrative will to be driving something that could be in a state government it could be in an organization it could be you know in an industry set up anywhere but if there is political and administrative will to be driving something uh, that will end up happening irrespective of whatever challenges that exist one example of that when i spoke of the family uh, databases of consolidating of welfare for a family we saw the pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana pmgky that came about in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic which looked at providing a family sort of a portfolio of uh, you know welfare provisions and that idea was there where it was it had a political will and a focus they did sort of permeate quite a lot of uh, you know quite a lot of people in doing that and so we're seeing that similarly with schemes with uh, welfare provisions across where there is that sort of backing and then the budgets are the second thing so which is where it is important to understand so even in the union budget that came out this year in feb of 22 right it was important to study and understand what areas are being allocated more of a priority and which ones aren't and that is sort of an indication to show which pieces will be taken up uh, where change is possible where convergence is possible across these different stakeholders at more at a government level and then the rest of the people i think grounds up it's more about demand uh, so the supply is an issue from say the government end the demand and awareness is an issue from the uh, grounds up and that is where i think the change is more in terms of the mindset when it comes to the different vulnerability groups how much what sort of uh, agency does a woman in the household have to be making decisions say even about her own body to say what kind of food she should be eating during a uh, pregnancy so from smaller like absolutely small things of that nature to bigger financial uh, related you know decisions that they are making the bank account details is one thing but also how how is that money being spent who's in charge of that who makes the decisions about uh, where the child will go to school who is so all of those pieces are uh, grounds up i think it's a lot more of behavior change that is required there and there being amenable to change i think is just a very broad term so i can't comment on whether we've seen people be okay changing it's very difficult uh, but change is also the only thing that is constant so i think it depends on what is the key priority for them at that point uh, and how are we able to tap into that how are you able to make it a win win situation because it can't be about something that i think is right right it has to be right for the family and for family at like the ground level and for the government at that level and there have to be enough parameters to shake that system up uh, so collaboration again there becomes key because if all intermediaries are saying the same thing then people are more amenable to change so if like you know the six of us on this panel are saying the exact same thing over and over again for the next 30 minutes you'll probably start believing somewhere that it's true uh and so you know something like that amplified at a national level is what will be really required yeah uh, thank you thank you madhuri i hope that answered the question um now to samana if you want me to repeat the question i can i just want to ask you that can i just wanted to make sure yeah. i write everything sure 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 um so uh, what are what are some of the challenges or bottlenecks you face as an employer in making the processes more worker centric are there any learnings which can be replicated across industry and other players um so uh let me see in terms of bottlenecks in making systems uh, more worker centric um 
we have not seen a lot of that what we've seen is that uh, you know if like i said if the conversations with the workers are a little bit transparent um, even when there's policy change being brought in or anything like that if if we are thinking about it and discussing it with them uh, everything seems to get a little bit easier to do um, so we've not had had bottlenecks in that in terms of what is replicable in terms of other in for other companies or other stakeholders uh, one of the things that we do at the plant and that to me we've done really well is that we have this process called deskilling that we run uh, where we have kind of taken these jobs that are supposed to be done by extremely qualified people and deskilled it um, so it doesn't have to be some great shakes thing so an example of that is we used to have uh, you know foreman to do machine change rovers and that had to be you know iti certified and blah blah um until one day the foreman that we had was giving our head of production a lot of trouble and he gave her a resignation and she signed it and you know then we realized okay now we better do something about this so what we did was we called the machine manufacturers to our plant um and said you know we have these really lovely women on the floor who would really like to learn how to use these machines do you think you could teach them what to do um instead of us having to bring in qualified people for everything and they learned it and the whole system just totally turned around right our change over times became shorter we did things more one thing we did so this is where conversations come into place right those rolls we used to get of these plastic wraps used to be i think the 35 kilos or something like that before uh we moved that from 35 to 15 kilos so that it was easier for them to move these rolls around and do things like that but essentially taking jobs and sort of making the easier version come out you know it's sort of like this this tech thing right that everything must be tech and only then is it easy but sometimes it just it's not required um that right? you can you can turn those things down so at the plant each section within the plant has a worker supervisor that lady runs the entire unit for that section so what is she supposed to do sort of explain in a very checklist one two three four five things this is the way it runs you are responsible to make sure it runs like that and that has really sort of brought about a system and one of the things we instituted with that is that you have to train the next person to do this job as well right because then moving them around one also showed us who's really multifaceted but it also brings in more opportunity for more people so yes you know while i was running the the supervisory position for this team for a while my next one i may not be in the supervisory position i may be working under somebody again but uh, but that has really worked for us and the skilling has been something that you know we're very proud of and we do it really well and uh, and to me that has been one of our major reasons of success yeah uh, thank you thank you samana that is um, yeah i i personally i haven't heard of that approach so that is even uh, new for me um <laughs> yeah i I'll, i'll move to dr kale and uh, I, i this question is specifically on the bc agents and their incentivization so uh, how are bc agents being incentivized to take up financial service delivery across india and how can this model be made sustainable and scalable across uh, the geographies in india that's <laughs> yeah over to you dr kale thank you so much okay this is this is a huge problem and I, 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 uh, you know there is a similarity in the answers that everyone is giving and out here we have a huge problem of data right we we actually don't know i mean you think we don't know how many migrant workers are there we still don't know how many business correspondents are there so when arushi says that uh, you know there's a cash access, there's a there's a problem of access to cash uh, that that's what beneficiaries are, are talking about the reserve bank says 95% of our banking outlets are in rural areas which does not solve does not answer our question right so the first thing first thing we really need to have is a lot of data which is granular geographic we need to know what's happening in each state we need to know what's happening in each district we need to know what's happening at the village level that that number we still don't have we have no information on usage we have no information on transactions we have no information on gender uh we are actually kind of you know moving in the dark so uh, a lot of survey work that's done by people like microsave by dwara research and so on dhatakshap this is the kind of information that actually comes up 
you know, in front or what representation comes from the Business Correspondent Federation of India, for instance, or the industry tells us something. But there is no national or a holistic framework. So any answer that I give you is going to be based upon what answers we've got or what we've heard from different people who've been working on the field. Right. So mm. I still feel that you know, giving viability um, is one huge issue. Uh, definitely, they're not getting paid even the amount that um, 2012 committee had said that they should be getting, Nandan Lekhani committee said they should be getting 3.14%. They're not getting that. They're getting something like 0.5% and they have a cap of 15 rupees per transaction, which is not sustainable for a lot of, this is for DPT uh, payouts, okay, which is not sustainable. Um, do banks give more services out to agents? No, they don't. There is a lot of resistance from a bank branch to even give uh, additional services out to uh, to the agents. Again, like I said, this if this information were available at a granular level from the Reserve Bank of India, it would be such an enriching conversation. You know, you could actually point to say that you know where where is usage lacking? Why is it lacking? We actually have some. Uh, some you know concrete uh, co concrete answer. So right now the work the um, DFS and the finance ministry has set up a working group. It's public sector banks, but uh, this is to look into the BC issues, and we can just hope that one of the terms of reference is about viability. So we just hope that some numbers come out of there, some kind of costing exercise is done, some kind of data comes out, so we at least have some information about you know what is the current situation. For the country, I'm sorry if this sounds like a very um, iffy answer, but the the principles are all there in place. Okay, that they need to be paid, but who is getting paid, how much, and for what is still an open question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Kavya. No, no, that is a similar issue is something that we are facing on ground uh, while implementing Chalo as well. That you don't really have any data points to reference uh, to really uh, you know communicate or or have a BC network at place because there isn't a really any data that you can go back to. I think the last one was uh, when the pandemic hit and the BCFI said that the BC agents need to be paid 5,000 uh, rupees, but that was the last update on any remuneration that we had got. Yeah, so that was one 5,000. Also, I would think that it depends upon where the agent is uh, situated and what kind of work he's actually doing as to how much of money he should be getting and be rewarded for yeah. that. So there are a lot of multiple issues in that and definitely isn't is, is a huge challenge because yeah. you know, door revenue is linked up to training is linked up to quality of services linked up to grievance redressal mechanism everything falls into place once people are paid and you know you just give a mandate out that this this rollout has to happen public sector banks are doing a wonderful job but not efficiently mm. <laughs> yeah uh, i would in fact, ask if any panelists, any of the panelists have questions for each other. Um, and yeah, I think. Yeah, I do. Uh, I wanted to say, Samana, wonderful work that's being done uh, from the industry. But I think the empathy that comes out from an employer towards their workforce is going to be, uh, I think, uh, you know, a basic a fundamental. Is there a role for the Chamber of Commerce? to play in you know, disseminating this kind of best practice that you have amongst other uh, partners? Absolutely. I think that that is a way to, I mean, obviously do it is through the chambers of commerce. And like I said, like knowledge sharing is a huge thing. That's why for us, social compact has been what it has been is because it is an industry led thing um, that, you know, what are other people doing? And then our shared resource center that is there you know, where anybody from the industrial area, any workers can come in and do what they want. But in terms of letting people know that, you know, it really is your responsibility to take care of these things. Um, I think that that's the only way to do it is to show people that it's doable and you can keep your businesses thriving. Like it doesn't, it's not one, it doesn't need to be a pick. Um, so I think, yeah, absolutely. I think any kind of place where we can do some knowledge sharing and kind of talk about best practices at different companies and what we're doing better, um you know can be if i had to give you an example even uh, we're a women-led industry we are a women-led everything and it still took us maybe only a few years ago to realize we did not have a sanitary pad program in place uh, and that only happened once we got somebody from external and they were talking to us about something and she said no what about how do you address this and you know, my sister and I kind of looked at each other and we said, we don't, and we need to do it now. And it was implemented the next day, but 
thing is unless you start these conversations how are they going to happen um so it uh, so yeah i think i think you're right i think chamber of commerce plays a huge huge thing in that as well um if i could uh, just titra i think since you guys are all here and you do a lot more work on the ground is there something that you would like industry to start like say a, a small media player like us to start addressing immediately like this is you know this is really something you guys can do and you can do it now um is there do you guys have any sort of pinpoints that you would you would recommend for us um i think samana like i said right uh, some sort of institutionalization of benefits in mm. a way that when workers are onboarded to, at, at at any employer's place right yeah. you typically have some checklists yeah uh, or so, so why not include a component of social security mm. be it even be it even sensitization of those workers to just at least let them know and start these modules of basic things because i mean again i totally understand the problem with you know women workers because we we are trying to work with domestic workers a lot and the yeah. same problem right like we don't want anything on our bank account because mm. my husband will access yeah right? so i want everything in cash how do we how do we solve these things how do we actually tell them you know there are ways where your husband can't access it there yeah. are there are channels where only you can access so some form of institutionalization in terms of welfare benefits mm-hmm. right from the day that the worker joins and unfortunately not wait for a pandemic like situation where most of the industry you know uh, got got them got this tg at the forefront Uh, so i think we we could i mean happy to chat offline but something of those things. great and one of the things that we did, we do that we are very careful of is you know at least making sure that the essic benefits are things that they know how to avail of we know for sure that that's something that needs to be done and that so that we actually found when we did our sort of site visit with social compact that they knew how to access that and that was a big thing for us that okay we you at least know how to get there because we don't then we are failing on this front uh, but they did so like that i think that you know that would be an interesting chat for me to have is what are the welfare benefits we need to address immediately and say that you know this is what what you are entitled to yeah i think the conversation has started already <laughs> so yeah i i, I mean it, it it feels glad to to be able to witness uh, this um if there are any other questions that the panelists have for each other then we can address those um yeah otherwise we can uh, wrap up the session okay um no so thank you everyone uh for registering your presence and thank you the panelists for uh initiating this dialogue with each other and among the different players in the ecosystem uh and i hope the conversations I, i mean at this moment i'm pretty sure that the conversations will be uh continued after this webinar and um we have the last webinar for the series on housing and migration and we would also want everyone uh to join in uh for that so thank you everyone thank you again and have a good evening thank you Thanks a lot you. Thank you. Thank you.